Welcome to Transform Talk 2, which is on community enablement. We've got 30 minutes to cover the subject matter, and I've got key speakers here with me. Amy Pitt, Service Director of Communities, Herefordshire Council, and virtually Patrick Odling-Smee, Director of Housing Services at the London Borough of Havering. And I'm going to ask them, after I do a brief introduction, to outline the projects they're involved in. There was a piece of research undertaken by IESI called Surviving to Thriving, and it involved more than 100 local authorities being questioned and three levels of development were identified. The first level was authorities as providers of services. That then moved towards authorities becoming customer-centric call centres, starting to put the customer at the centre of what they were doing in terms of service delivery. And the third level was community enablement. Councils starting to enable their communities to meet their own needs. That's rarer but is becoming more and more prevalent in terms of what authorities are trying to do. And because we've had that document published for some years and have been updating it with research every year, we thought it would be a good idea to get some practitioners in who are doing projects that are involving community enablement, ask them to describe their projects to you, give you the opportunity to ask any questions that occur to you, and find out what's key to delivering community enablement at the coalface. So I'll start by asking Amy to outline the project and then I'll go on to Patrick to outline the project and then we'll have a discussion. Okay, so Amy, great. over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to talk about Talk Community um, and Talk Community is an approach that Herefordshire Council has um, developed um, and it's an approach that for us to work in partnership with our communities, our business sector, our residents to really to bring Herefordshire residents together and to build resilient communities across, across the whole of Herefordshire to connect people into those communities, to keep people as well for as long as we possibly can, to, um, which is absolutely the right thing to do, um, and then ultimately you know, to reduce demand down on all formal services. Um, it's very much around um, it's trying to provide um, and work with communities to um, have services and support at the right time to the right people, um, and, um, and that prevention, that early intervention um, support um, through, through communities. And it's an all ages approach as well. It's primarily um, in Herefordshire, it primarily started from adults, adult social care. We went through a huge transformation project probably about um, six years ago on a strength based model. Um, and then the talk community kind of evolved out of that. Um, and we, we kind of predicate it on three key um, areas, which is how can I help myself? How can I help my community? And how can my community help me? So, um, it really accelerated during COVID, just like many areas, you know, we, we really saw communities come together and support each other and help each other and really talk community really accelerated in its approach with that. Um, and it gave us a great foundation then to work with our communities and um, community organisations, volunteers, etc. Um, across across Herefordshire. Herefordshire is a very rural county and um, we're one of the rural, uh, you know, one of the, um, in, across in England. Um, and so, you know, we have a number of fantastic community organisations, but it's also about facilitating a different approach with them to bring them together and, like I say, to, to connect those communities. So within Talk Community, um, we've got, I've got a number of operational teams um, and they are um, community development officers, Talk Community Development Officers, and they work on, a, on the primary care network footprint, working very closely with our statutory services, um, as well as the communities to build those communities. Um, and then we also have, I also have um, a number of teams around health and wellbeing, um, as well as things like customer services as well that we kind of put on the primary care network footprint as well. And I've got a transformation program, project and underneath Talk Community as well. And there's a number of different work streams on those. One of the, one of the key ones, and I suppose a, a bit of our, what we think is a gem in Hereford, we've got nearly 70 Talk Community hubs across Herefordshire. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and, we're really, and that's across an 18 month period that we've, um, we've worked with our communities to have those. So they're in the community, led by, led by the community for the community. And they can range from um, a village hall twice a, twice a month opening to in the city where we've got them open sort of um, every day um, at certain, um, people can come in they can connect they can be um um, I'll go online to look at information advice and signposting because we've got a really wealth of information online on the talk community directory so we signpost, signpost people through to, to that directory um, 
And a number of other things as well. We've got, um, we've been running the holiday activity program through Talk Community and having some really great success with children's children to be um, connected to their community. We've trained a number of volunteers in mental health, mental health well-being, over 200. And one of the things that we are, um, obviously, with the, with, the, with the crisis at the moment, economic crisis, we're working with communities to provide low-level debt and financial management support through the hubs, through the food banks, um, and we've supported over 500 people in 18 months with that and £800,000 worth of debt. So it's, it's constantly evolving, constantly developing, we're constantly working with the community to see actually how do they, you know, what do they want, what do they need in their community and how can we work with them to develop that. And it's a really different approach, you know, that we've taken as a council, not, you know, this, I suppose a traditional way of council often comes in to, to do things, it's actually how, do, you know, the community's leading it. How um, have you funded it? So um, we were fortunate that we got some funding through the Better Care Fund. Right. Through, um, we we, we, we um, um, had that. Local authorities also funded it. Um, and um, so, for example, our talk community hubs, we provide up to £2,500 of grants for them to sort of set up. Most of them use it on things like iPads so people can go in and connect. Um, but yes, we're, you know, we're really fortunate that the council, the members and our health colleagues are really supportive of the, the approach in Hereford and can see, see the benefits and, um, uh, and, and want to put, invest in it. Fantastic, thank you. I'm going to turn now to Patrick and ask him to outline the project he's leading. Wow, yeah, I'd follow that. So <laughs> I feel um, maybe, maybe um, ours, is, ours is a little more um, uh, or less impressive than, than, than uh, the Herefordshire example. But uh, what we've done over the last uh, two years is set up two um, community hubs um, that bring together a range of organisations, uh, council, council services, as well as uh, local community voluntary and charity sector um, to enable residents to um, have advice and support services they need uh, and it brings them under one roof in the community where they are. Um, we've got two uh, community hubs that we've set up uh, and we have plans to uh, develop more across the borough uh, over the next few years. So we have, have one in, um, in Harold's Hill uh, which is in the north of the borough, and one in Rainham, which is in the south of the borough. These are the two areas we've targeted, which are specifically the areas of highest deprivation. Um, and we've joined with partners. Um, so um, we have uh, Peabody, who um, take, take the lead and run the community food shop in Harold Hill. And we've also got uh, Waits, who are our regeneration partner, who've helped us with um, various building projects across, uh, uh, you know, to, to bring the buildings into, into use. So the hub started in March 2020, um, and um, we have opened them up uh, with um, various uh, um, voluntary sector organisations to support it. Um, in the, I suppose the project started in March 2020. We actually, in June 21, opened up the first um, Harold Hill hub, um, and that's open two days a week um, in Harold Hill. And then we've got the, um, the Raynham Hub that opened in September 2021. Um, and they've both been uh, quite successful. Uh, we've moved premises. The Harold Hill Hub was in temporary accommodation um, in, a, in, a, in an old um, council office. And we've moved it into a permanent home now in the local library. The two... Um, <coughs> Excuse me. The two um, physical hubs have been supported by a, uh, a virtual hub that is um, that provides a range of, of information and advice and support um, for uh, for people across the board. Um, so um, we've, I, I suppose, one of one of the the, the, cre the key um, successes of this has actually been. As we go into the, um, the cost of living crisis, the hubs have been central to the council's response to provide support to people in the in the um, in the community hubs, um, and particularly uh, advice and, and information. Um, what we have found in terms of learning is the um, the community food shops have been the, the main focus of um, of bringing people in and encouraging for. Football. Um, and that has been central to um, people have come. We have queues of people waiting outside to come in every day. And as they come in and use the community food shop, 
the, um, the, the, that means that we can then capture them. So we have um, voluntary sector organisations, we have uh, council services, we have a range of services, and we, uh, and we can actually encourage people to use those services. And that's been a real um, way of, of, of developing those um, and, and getting people to engage in it. Um, I, I'm not sure how much more I want. I, I noticed I've just been joined by Charlie Allen. Who's Absolutely. Actually, he's done a lot of the work. So Charlie, I don't know if you want to add anything into that. What so just, just by way of introductions, Charlie Allen is the Transformation Project Manager, London Borough of Havering. And so he joins us now. Welcome, Charlie. If you Thank could, you. Um, we're, we're in the process of outlining the project. So um, anything you want to add to that general introduction, please? Yeah, so um, I didn't catch uh, everything Patrick said because I joined a little bit late, but um, I think the, the main thing to sort of highlight is how the partner working has really, really sort of worked, developed over the pandemic. And it's been a key, key aspect of the hub. So um, our VCS partners, we just wouldn't be able to run it without them. So, so building that relationship has really, really helped help the hub develop and flourish, really. And I think, like Patrick's mentioned there, uh, the community food shop has been really a really big point in that um, and that that brings regularly 50 people a day uh, per day the hub is open so um we sort of they come in um the, the food shop sort of brings the people in and then we've just got the range of services that patrick um sort of outlined the council services and vcs services to uh to support residents um when they come in so it's like a, a one-stop shop as it were for for sort of um, needs in the borough and can I ask funding? How was the project funded? Right, I'll, I'll answer that one. So it, it was funded internally, um, and um, and so so we we did provide it through through our corporate. We have a transformation budget, so it was part of the uh, the council transformation. But that's that's in terms of setting it up and to, and, and resourcing it from the council side. But the voluntary sector have actually brought in a huge amount of, of their own resources. So, for example, Peabody, um, who are the key partner in the Harold Hill Hub, um, are a local um, housing, housing association who have worked with us all the way along. And they put in a manager who has, um, who has um, worked with us to develop the hub. So they put in a huge amount of resources as well. And it could, you know, and that's difficult to quantify. But actually, um, unless we had that voluntary sector input, I don't think they would have been as successful as we as we um, as they have been. So we've got two examples from you: um, one rural, one urban, um, different but the same. Does the strategy for their creation and rollout come from the council, from the community, jointly? What caused? The idea's genesis. What what created the strategy that led to the creation of your initiative? So, Amy. Um, so, so ours was on the back of um, a transformation program that we did through adult social care, um, where it was very much around the strength-based model of how you know, like I said before, in terms of how we can support and the asset-based model, so how people can help themselves, then their family and network, and then obviously then the communities and then formal services. So it's, it was very much a strategic approach. But obviously, once we sort of considered that strategic approach, we obviously want to work with the communities and residents themselves in terms of how we develop it and how we involve it. Um, so it's initially a, like a strategic approach, but you know, like I said, as it evolves and develops, we, we do that in um, collaboration with the community. And in your case, you have parish councils? Yes, we do. Yeah. How do they work with those community hubs? So it's, it's I completely honest, it's a range. We have some who are very, really engaged and some who aren't, you know, and that, you know, there are some it's, um, where it's, they don't sort of, you know, mix, mix so really well, if I'm honest. So, um, so they, it, is, it is a combination through talk community as well. We've, we've started to try and, um, a different approach with our talk, with our parishes as well. So we have like a talk parish meeting that we have very regularly to how, connect, again, to connect the communities and the parish councils together. But it does range in terms of, because we've got over 120 um, parishes in Herefordshire, so yeah, yeah it's, that, it's that's right. Yeah. Can, can I ask you the same question, Patrick? Do you want to keep um, this up? Yeah, the I, I suppose the genesis was it was the, a, a, a vision for the from the council. So it was um, in the, initially the the chief operating officer had had the initial vision, but it was it was part of a and 
a drive to change the way that we deliver our services um, and the fact that our, um, our, our services are, are, are very much re remote and weren't um, based, in, based in the local community and people had to travel. Whilst we are an urban um, uh, area, we are very dispersed. So we have seven towns within Havering. So it's a, it's a large geographical area. And travel between those towns and service and, and accessing services is always um, difficult. Um, and particularly for those more deprived communities, actually the price of a bus to go and access council services <coughs> is quite high. And um, and people weren't using the 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 um, telephone or, or other ways of accessing services. But also we wanted to engage more effectively with the, with the voluntary sector. And, and, and the community organisations in those areas. And that can only really be done on a local basis. So one of the strengths of the uh, our community hubs has been the governance arrangements that we put in place. So we have a, um, a, 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 a leadership team, a community hubs leadership team in each of the areas. And they have representatives from the local community. They have representatives, um, some, some local councillors as well, but represent, representatives from, from the, um, the, the voluntary sector um, and council, but they're, but they're very much voluntary sector led and it's the council supporting the voluntary sector in those areas. Um, and they've been a real strength in making sure that the, the services that are delivered at those hubs reflect the demands and the needs of that local community rather than the council just deciding what it should be. Thank you. We've got a delegate question. How can we increase the level of participation from local residents for our community focused initiatives? So can I start with you? How, how yeah. do you get them to play? So it's a great question because, um, you know, often you get the same people who do want to be involved with, um, you know, with these community initiatives, which is which is great. And what we certainly did is we went with where the energy was to really kind of oh. just to get the energy so we could get the, the ball rolling and, you know, to, to, to focus it in those areas. Um, for me, but it's, it's very much good. It, it, it is time and it does, it does take time to go out and really do that engagement and get people um, involved. We did a really large piece of engagement in February um, with families and children in Herefordshire and we went really went out into the communities. It was led by the community organisations. We funded them to, to lead that. Um, and we had one of the biggest um, inputs from the community and family, children and families that we've ever had because wow. over 1,700 families and children that were involved with that um, because we went out and it wasn't led by the local authority. That, you know, we were there, we gave the framework of what, we were, what the kind of information that we were looking for, but it was led by, the, by those community organisations and those community leaders. So I think for me it's going out there to the people rather than often expecting them to come to us. Thank you. Patrick, what, what would you say? Um, and Charlie, sorry. Both yes, Charlie, Charlie may come in on this. I think I think it's really important that um, you actually um, reflect what the, the needs of the community is um, and and go out to them. So there's a geography to that. So it, we make sure that you're you're on their doorsteps and you're not providing services from remote buildings somewhere where, they, where they're not actually going to be engaged, but provide different ways of people to, to engage with it. But it is about um, talking to the community, understanding what their needs are, and then reflecting that back. So, for example, in our Raynham um, hub, we learned that we very quickly learned, because actually we basically opened it up and very few people came in. And we had to learn that because actually what was on offer was what was was not in demand so we had to change we had to change the offer so change it to a, have a d different services available do some marketing to make sure that people were, were aware that it existed but also then open up a community food a food bank as well which gave them a reason to come in because unless people got a reason to engage and they're getting something out of it why would you bother <laughs> and I think we we will. It's not it's not just about saying you know these are our services. You should be grateful for it. It's actually saying and unless we're doing going to provide you something that you need and you want, there's no point in you engaging with us. So was that fed back, Charlie, into how the council's doing transformation? Has it affected the way the council's working generally? 
Yeah, yeah. So um, definitely a big part of our engagement was the community focus groups that we held for each of the hubs. And then they were sort of able to feedback what's needed in the community. And then um, I think it's changed, changed the way some of the council teams are able to um, to speak with members of the community. So before there were some services, especially during the pandemic, where there wasn't that face to face option. But um, since we get like a really quite good footfall into the hub, um, it, it's encouraged a lot of council teams to instead um, come to the hub itself and then directly engage with residents there. Um, and it's th that sort of um, way of council services sort of changing is, is definitely been influenced by the hubs and being able to have that direct access to, to the residents who, who are sort of accessing the services really. Has there been a clash of strategies because you've got the digital strategy saying let's move contact online it reduces the cost, let's get them interacting via the web. And what you're actually talking about here is, is bringing people together and allowing them to help solve their own challenges, needs and problems. Is there a clash between the two strategies or do they complement each other? I think they complement each other, uh, absolutely. Um, I think, um, you, you know, I think we're all going absolutely um, that way in terms of that di di digitally enabled. So, um, you know, having as much information advice and signposting as we can online, but there's always going to be a need for people to, you know, um, need formal services as well and have, have that sort of face-to-face -face contact. Um, but I think, you know, through, through, the, through the communities um, and through certainly from our, from our model, you know, it's, it's enabling people to connect into their communities, to give them an offer out in their communities. Um, so to, to keep them well and safe for as long as they possibly can in, in their communities, which you know, is, is the best place for people to be. So um, and from our perspective at the moment, we are doing a, a customer and digital transformation programme. And at the heart of that is our talk community approach of you know, how do we help, how can we get people to help themselves and how can they can work with the communities? Uh, are you the same or different, Patrick Jolly? Charlie, you want to... uh, yeah, no, I'd, I'd say it's quite similar, really. Um, we do, um, we find actually it's probably people who have different needs. Um, so, so people who access our services online, um, they, can, they can often find out a solution to the problem there. But we found that the hub still sort of helps, helps the people that, that need that extra support and that face-to-face -face support. So it's, they've not really clashed. They've been sort of more of a two-pronged approach of uh, mm. depending on the resident's need, really. And the and the the virtual hub has a broader um, use as well. So we, we've done, we've done some uh, on some new new developments. We've used the community hub to um, invite people to online events, online consultation events, and they get a broader it gets a broader reach in the community than our traditional council email targeting um, approach. So, because it goes out there and it gets in, it get it, it get it, it gets a quite a broad um, brush. So it's been useful to complement, but it attracts people in. So you know, you get, you get emails about events that are happening so to encourage people to come in and and, and take them up. So I think they it is complementary, um, but it's but it's but it's again it's quite locally focused. So um, in those particular areas. Um, there are a community of people who are all part of that 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 virtual hub, um, and that just makes communication and engagement with them much more um, simple. So, was your choice of area in a, in a similar way to Amy's that you looked for where people were prepared to get involved? Yeah, well, it was primarily what well, one of them was was about deprivation and, and improve uh, uh, redu reducing levels of deprivation, and that was about work, particularly working with the voluntary sector with people who are um, high levels of poverty. So the, the areas were selected because they were the key um, deprived areas of the borough. Um, and as we go through our next stages of the strategy in terms of development, we'll be looking at which, which are the, the other areas that we should be targeting um, and the other deprived areas. But these were the, that, the, the selection of areas was more about how we address levels of deprivation in those areas. And how does it work with councillors and surgeries and link across to them? So how do you make councillors and their surgeries still meaningful when actually you've got these hubs? 
So um, some of our councillors do the surgeries in, in those hubs as well, um, and they, they, they work really closely with some of the, some of the hubs. Um, our councillors are really supportive of, of the model. Um, um, so yeah, so they, they'll, the combination really, they'll do it in, you know, in, their hub, in the hub or they'll do it in their, in, their, in their kind of surgery. So yeah, combination. So it links together and is seen to strengthen. Yeah. Is, is that the same for you? Well, all right. Um, <laughs> Interestingly, we had, we had a, um, an interesting uh, running with, with uh, the, 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 the former administration who, um, whilst they loved the hub, wanted to see them as apolitical, so they, they, they banned all surgeries uh, in the hubs initially. Um, the current administration have changed that, so now they do uh, have their surgeries in the hubs. So there has been a change, I think, all, all, all councillors like the hubs, mainly because the communities love the hubs, so therefore, you know, that they, 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 they see them as successful, so therefore they want to be part of that, um, that delivery. But um, they, have, they have varied their, how, how, how engaged they want to be. And I think part of that was because initially surgeries were seen to be political. Um, and part of it is some of our more deprived communities um, uh, have councillors from one party. Uh, who aren't who weren't at the time the lead administration? So they they wanted to. It, there was it was a bit of power games going on about who was taking credit for it and uh, who couldn't take credit for it. So thank you for being very That's candid, <laughs> Ken, Ken, So we're coming towards the end of the time. I want I want to ask you in turn. So starting with you, Amy, what would be the one thing you would do differently if you were doing it again? Um, great question. Um, what to do differently? Um, I think um, I don't think I'd, maybe not differently, but maybe from the be maybe from the beginning, really sort of um, engage maybe right at the right at the very start in terms of with the communities, you know, right from the beginning. Yes, it was a strategic approach from the council, but actually maybe more of that um, engagement really right right you know upstream um, and, and you know to really get that momentum, but. I mean, constantly it's evolving and developing all the time. You know, it's not a static project. It's, it's evolving all the time with that engagement anyway. Um, and, you know, and it, and it can, it, it can be flexible in terms of its approach. Um, and that's the reason, you know, that's why we set it up in the way, the way it has been really. So, but yeah, for me, the key learning is absolutely get the engagement and with the communities as early on as, as possible. Thank you. Patrick, Charlie, what would you do differently? The one thing. The one thing, uh, don't do it in a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, a very strong statement, <laughs> Charlie. Yeah, I think I agree, agree with Amy. Really, I think um, getting community engaged and on board straight away is uh, makes makes it sort of shapes it how the community wants it and makes the pathways easier. But um, we were fortunate to get the voluntary sector involved from from the very beginning. But I think yeah, the, the project is constantly evolving. So just as much engagement with the communities. Uh, to make sure we're providing the services that's needed in the area, really. And what you've said, interestingly, is very common because we had a, a, a digital session earlier. And again, the people there were saying, you know, they would have started the engagement earlier. And so I think that that's a, a common thread amongst the projects. We're coming towards the end of our time. Um, we have two breakout sessions after this at 1.45, one on cyber security and the other on regeneration, which will follow on from this. Both are being held on Microsoft Teams, and you can join them directly from the agenda page in the conference portal. The links are provided on the page. I would like to thank the three of you for participating today and telling us about your projects. They are fantastic projects. They are examples of community enablement. They're evolving over time and really making a difference to your residents and communities. Uh, and, and they're exemplars for you and your authorities. And uh, really your efforts combined in delivering them. So thank you for that. That's the end of our session. Thank you.